Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith, and this week, as one of the last masterminds of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda goes on trial in The Hague, survivors of the mass killings speak to France 24 about their memories of the brutality that Felicia Kabuga is accused of having bankrolled. Also, children from across Cameroon's war-torn Anglophone regions have escaped to a bilingual school in the French-speaking town of Melong. Their teachers help traumatized kids take on the daunting challenge of learning in a new language. And women boxers in Libya hit back at stereotypes that undercut their agency. Athletes at one ring in Tripoli saying that it's time to knock out outdated gender roles. But first, one of the last alleged masterminds of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda is being put on trial at a UN court in The Hague. After 23 years on the run, 87-year-old Felicia Kabuga was arrested in France in 2020 and is now facing charges over his alleged role in the mass killings. He's accused of having financed and organised killing squads and bankrolling a radio station that broadcasts genocidal propaganda. Clément Duroma reports from Rwanda. Epaphrodite Nyenigondo survived the Tutsi genocide. In 1994, his two brothers were murdered in this district of the Rwandan capital. They were killing people here where I'm standing. There were corpses everywhere and they were thrown into the gutter here or on a mass grave there. The inhabitants of the Muhima neighborhood still live in the shadow of this building, built by Felicien Kabuga, a once wealthy businessman accused by the international justice of financing the massacres. Epaphrodite lived near the building at the time. He escaped the Hutu militias who massacred Tutsis. After the genocide, he joined Ibuka, an organization of survivors supported by the government. He remembers the comings and goings of the militiamen. That building over there was the house of Felician Kabuga. It hosted a base of the former ruling party, the MRND. The neighborhood's militiamen came to take their weapons here. They came from the north of the country. They came out of the house when they were ordered to go and kill. After more than 20 years on the run, Felicien Kabuga was arrested in France in 2020. A specialized court also accuses him of financing Radio des Mille Collines, a station encouraging the massacres. Il y avait there were a lot of messages saying that the Tutsis are enemies of the country, that you have to kill them. That's how a lot of extremists were convinced that they had to kill. For his responsibilities within the extremist media, Kabuga will be tried for incitement to commit genocide. Randa issued more than 40 international arrest warrants against suspected genocide perpetrators living in France. They are still pending, according to the Rwandan authorities, for whom the trial of Felicien Kabuga is an urgent matter. Time passes and people get older. Organizers died and we didn't hear about it until 10 or 15 years afterwards. And they never went to court. This is bad for the history of the country and for the victims. But Kabuga already pled not guilty. His lawyers have called for the prosecution to be discontinued due to his poor health. Students in Niger have struggled through a tough start to the academic year. Around 900 schools have been shut because of the risk of attack from armed groups and an ongoing drought has made things even harder for pupils. The city of Ulam is trying to accommodate an influx of new learners who've had to relocate because of the extreme weather. Harold Girard tells us more. School hasn't started yet, but the students come regardless. Around 900 of them are enrolled at this school, originally built for 500. Many are the children of villagers from the north who had to move because of the droughts. They ended up here in Walam. It was tough to change schools. In our village, we did not have enough water, even for a small cattle farm. It was not enough. Over there, it was difficult. The crops, fetching water, Everything was difficult. Parents often send their children to school not for the classes, but for the promise of a free meal, meaning that school attendance depends on local crops not failing. On top of that, the school principal says he doesn't get enough government support to ensure the students have access to even basic resources. When you look at the school, first, we do not have fences around. 
If you look at the classrooms, lots of them are not even finished. We also need help for furniture, tables for example. We need books and school supplies. Over the past year and a half, the government has set up 29 centralized education centers. These high-capacity schools have added 52,000 school places across the Tilaberi region, but 70,000 more are needed, according to the Ministry of Education. Everybody has been getting down to work since we took over and since the president made education his priority. Today, I believe that not all the problems, but the majority of the problems, will be solved for this new school year. You will see that the start of the school year will be quite normal across the country in education centres where emergency education has been put in place. Well, thousands of English-speaking school children in Cameroon have also been struggling. Many displaced by conflict in Anglophone regions have sought refuge in French-speaking communities. Dealing with trauma as well as trying to study in a foreign language is often daunting. And one bilingual school in the town of Melong is trying to provide the tools to children to help them tackle the challenges. Our team tells us more. Singing Cameroon's national anthem in French and in English. These children all come from the country's Anglophone regions, where separatist-fueled violence has raged for nearly seven years. Forced to flee the conflict, Saint-Plice and his family found refuge in Melong, in Cameroon's Francophone region. Still traumatized by the atrocities he witnessed, the young boy hasn't been to school in nearly three years. But he's now back in the classroom and is hoping to make up for lost time. They was gone. Um, there was many types of condom there. Everything that was inside the school, they burned everything, everything. When they come to the village to come and fight, they will come and be sleeping inside the school. There's no warrior and I'm happy. Their teacher was also displaced by the conflict. As she tries to help the children move on, she must also reckon with her own painful past. When I'm teaching her, I'm forgetting the trauma. But although at times, if I don't hear any sound, I must shiver. It. Because the experience is still there, the gunshot. Over 200 schools were destroyed by Anglophone separatists since 2016 in a conflict that's showing little signs of abating. It's already claimed nearly 6,000 lives and displaced over a million people, most of them women and children. In Libya, boxing for girls was banned for over three decades. And though it's still pretty taboo, that hasn't stopped the teenagers at the Gargash Stars Club in Tripoli. They're fighting for more women to hit back at stereotypes that try to box them in. Kamin Nedlek has more. It may not look like a radical act, but in Libya, boxing isn't considered a woman's sport and girls who box face judgment. I was criticized by a lot of people for how I am a girl who practices boxing. They would say to me, you are a girl, aren't you afraid to be hit in the face? I didn't care for what people said. I fought against them. And thank God I am blessed. I am OK. Under former dictator Muammar Gaddafi, women's boxing was banned for more than 30 years. This boxing club opened in Tripoli a decade ago and now trains dozens of women and girls. Some even go on to fight in championships. They say boxing keeps them fit and safe. I want to advise girls like me, of my age or even older. Our society tells girls that it's shameful to do this or that. But on the contrary, when you are athletic, it's good for your health, for your physical strength. And most of all, you'll be able to defend yourself if you're harassed on the street. You wouldn't be weak because you are a girl. You would be strong and overcome this fear. These sportswomen credit the support of their families for letting them enjoy boxing despite the social disapproval. They're pushing for more female inclusion in the sport, one punch at a time. In Morocco, climate change has cast uncertainty over the way of life of the country's nomads. For centuries, they've roamed the deserts with their animals. 
But ever more intense droughts have dried up the water points on which they rely. Laurent Berstecker has more. Surrounded by the barren hills of the Sahara Desert, these Berber nomads prepare a meager lunch in the blistering heat. A few hundred meters away from their camp, a rocky riverbed is beginning to run dry. Like many others, this family is struggling to survive in an increasingly hostile environment. No one takes care of these lands anymore. They became arid and were affected by drought. There was no more vegetation and the water level decreased. Morocco is currently experiencing its worst drought in over 40 years and the situation is likely to deteriorate further, according to government forecasts. For nomadic tribes, which often travel in search of grazing and water for their herds, it's a millennia-old culture that's now under threat. Drought as well as land privatization has already driven many to leave their home regions, but even in their search of greener pastures, they often face resistance and hostility from local populations. We would like to go to other areas, but people chase us away and tell us to go home. They won't let us settle anywhere else. Assailed by nature and turned away by their peers, the ancient lifestyle of these nomadic tribes could soon become a thing of the past. The last government census in 2014 found that only 25,000 nomads still lived in the Moroccan desert. Well, that's it for Across Africa. Thanks for joining us and do so again. Take care.